Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's version of Acro's Credential Chats. I am super excited about this uh, week, uh, not just because we had last week off during the annual uh, Acro annual meeting, but also because we are joined this week by John Calderwood from Mott Community College, who gave just a really amazing session about uh, credit for prior learning at the annual meeting. And John, just thank you so much for taking the time out of your Monday afternoon to join us this week. Uh, no, thank you for the invite. Appreciate it. Um, you know, we had a few moments to kind of talk at the the presentation and caught up a couple other times. And then, uh, you know, you sent me the invite. Glad to be here. Well, and we're really glad, really excited to have you. You know, you, your session, John, was was called Prior Learning Assessment and Alternative Credentials, Portfolio, Best Practices, and More. And, uh, and you just got into so much just golden nuggets of wisdom and and at the same time, you know, one of the takeaways that I had from it was that for all of the kind of shiny things that that what you were kind of subtly advancing, unless I was just overly reading tea leaves, was was the idea that, you know, a lot of this is about change management and just, you know, getting down to, you know, our product, our, our practices and our, and our policies of how we want to, you know, what, what our procedures are, just figuring out those things. So that we can make all the you know big conceptually abstract things a lot more accessible. Uh, Noah, you hit it. Um, I I am not going to sit here and say subtly I was trying to, <laughs> um, because it, the these these were survey results out of a uh, larger survey that's coming from Acro, um, and it's kind of a update to a 2019 report that was done. Um, but what uh, when I first proposed this to ACRO, it was centered on just the portfolio assessment, which is, you know, if you've been a registrar for a hot minute, that's the messy side, right? That's the, you know, somebody worked for five years, compiled what they do, turn it into the college, college evaluates it for possibly for credit, um, industry credentials, you know, all of that. So I wanted to focus on the portfolio assessment, um, but there were some very interesting results and we can, you know, if you've got a couple of questions for me on that, we can go into it. Um, but also one of the key things, and I actually wrote this as a takeaway and maybe kind of prefaces this conversation, which is, you know, is, is prior learning assessment cultural or a convenience at your institution? And that's what I kind of based everything on. So if it's a cultural belief, you'll have buy-in. Um, if, if it's a convenience, you know, honestly, that they're offering to students, um, it's kind of a different perspective than it shows. Mm, yeah, I, you know, we, in a lot of these chats, uh, we hear from so many folks who share that knowing your why mm -hmm. is really important. And one of, one of the things I hear you saying is that, you know, when we know our why, we can also, you know, not just our own why of why we're doing this, but also institutional whys, it can also kind of give us a helpful temperature check of what's kind of going to be within the realm of, of reality for us to move the needle on. And and there's there's two when you talk about the reality, talk about moving the needle. OK, um, there's two key things that came out of this survey. And the first one, um, and we can't do this without them. So please, um, was centered on uh, questions that came back regarding faculty. And, and the the PLA process. And faculty are far and away the number one on the survey that uh, were respondent as helping students prepare these portfolios. They were absolutely number one as for the ones assessing it, but over 60% said that they have no formal training. So how do we get consistency, right? How do we get processes and procedures? How do we get ahead of that as an industry or just even an institution, um, if we're not having standards of practice, you know, in our own backyard. Um, the, the second item that really came up, um, again, centered around the student facing side, which is, you know, cost is still a barrier. Um, it's not covered by financial aid, primarily. And most of this has some sort of fees associated with it or multiple fees. So it, it, it's something where, depending on your institution and depending on your student base, um, institutions really have to be cognizant of that cost. 
Yeah. And, you know, that's probably a really good opening to talk about, you know, one of the things that I think you were really loud and clear about in your session was the importance of centering the learner. That, that, you know, we're not just doing this, you know, for students, but if we're not centering our learners, it, it can result in us doing things to our students. And, you know, I, I don't know if you, you feel comfortable just sharing some of your thoughts around, you know, just what that looks like to center the learner. What are some of the, you know, I, I one of the things that I know I took notes in and, you know, increase the size of the font and put in bold and highlighted in, in purple was around communication strategies to our learners. Uh, so I put up a quote in my presentation and it was a quote from Benjamin Franklin. And it started off the entire kind of, there's a little bit of information at the front, but what started kind of a review of how we talk to students or prospective students about prior learning assessment or credit for prior learning and its availability at institutions. And what I did is I took a, uh, it was a round table, but the first quick five, 10 minute discussion was centered on how do we communicate this to students? And I base it on tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. And that's a, a quote from Benjamin Franklin. And then what I had the group do is go through the survey results, which coincidentally the top two ways that we communicate prior learning assessment uh, to students is the catalog or the web page. So how does that involve a student to they learn? or so that they learn. And that was the discussion. And it really, um, I, I don't wanna say I got all the answers I thought I would on that. Um, there I, there was definitely some discussion, but some folks really had a hard time, you know, on this list saying what would tell, teach or involve. And we have to remember that on the student facing side, we can't ask them to be the experts just by throwing it up on a website. Yeah, I know I'm remembering uh, Field of Dreams, right? If you build it, they will come. <laughs> and and yeah, one of the things that, that I really caught it captured from your message was you know that we are really good at passively making students aware about credit for prior awareness um, opportunities. And that you know what you're really advocating for is how might we be more proactive in in in, in um, making them aware of, of opportunities. Yeah, you know, I, I know you talked about you know, it, it, making it part of the application that it's already, it's if you're applying, we're embedding this in the application process. Uh, you also talked about something that I, I'd love for you to kind of just expand on is, you know, one-stop shop events, not one-stop building. And, and could you mind sharing for people who weren't there? And, and you know, what, what do you mean by, by doing one-stop shop events and not versus a one-stop building? Certainly. So, so that came out of, uh, in Michigan, our governor has launched Michigan Reconnect. Uh, you might know Tennessee Reconnect is a similar type program where 25 and older were able to come back to college or come to college and have free in-district tuition and mandatory fees. Um, parts of Michigan, it has taken off. It has done very well at our institution. Other institutions just trying to get teeth into it. But what we found is, is that, you know, 25 and older really is getting into the, you know, adult learner model uh, for, for institutions. And that doesn't just mean community colleges. This means, you know, four-year institutions and, and farther on. So what we were finding with these students coming in is they didn't want to come into a building and become a pinball machine where they were just getting, you know, all over because it was a one-stop building. So you had to go upstairs to go see financial aid. You had to go downstairs to see admissions. You had to go to the West Wing to see advising. Um, I was an advocate from the start where we centered all of those departments in two large rooms in, in one area of the building. And I even said, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a folding table with a, a, a nice cloth over it. We had chairs on both sides of the tables students could walk in and the survey results, the pre-survey results. So when students registered for these events, they surveyed ahead of time and told us what they needed. Far and away, it 
the the application was like third or fourth down the line. It was Michigan Reconnect, it was financial aid, and then it was family life services, which is uh, help with utilities, help with child care, um, at risk of uh, homelessness, you know, all of those things. They wanted those services first. Once we solve those, we would literally watch students get up and go, okay, where do I sign? And we would just write down the hallway to the next room and admissions was waiting. So it really, it's about that just student facing side and answering those questions first. And the same concept goes with, you know, PLA. It needs to just be part of that initial conversation. So the, the one-stop event, get everybody in a room. If you don't have a room big enough, go rent it. Go, go do something, okay? Get all of them in there. And then that way the student isn't the expert on the next step. And, uh, and you know, I think that's something that I love about your pinball analogy is that, you know, the, the, is it also connects to something else that, that I wrote down that you'd said is do not ask students to be the experts in the process. And so even if there is a, you know, some a certain degree of pinballing that cannot be avoided, you know, the not forcing the ball to be the one that's moving itself, that we are at least hitting our flippers and moving them and guiding them through the process that, you know, and supporting them. And, and I guess uh, one thing that I don't want to just assume is that, and so I'll ask it is, you know, do you think it's kind of a little bit important for us to be, ask ourselves how comfortable we are with going a little bit outside of our own roles, right? In order to connect some dots for our learners, because it kind of sounds like in that big room, it, it might be a little bit of a flex for some of the people in a registrar office that we might have to answer some questions and take some ownership for things that are not strictly our way normally. And that goes to, and my background is enrollment management. You just hit the nail on the head. Um, enrollment management is about the start to finish process from when the student says, hey, I'm interested in your college, all the way through to the, the, the really fun day when I was a former registrar of being able to hit the button and kick them out of here with a degree. So it, enrollment management is that whole landscape of the student experience, and it's the backbone of it. So you, you hit the nail on the head about it isn't just about not expecting or stop expecting the student to be the expert in the process. It's as a college, not even reimagining reimagining the process, but putting the process in in out there in such a way that the student it, it's the environment like that they, they, it's everything that they need in one space. And it doesn't have to be all the time. Now, I will say we're going to have a remodel of our student success building. And our first floor is becoming a single space. So financial aid will be housed there, housing, you know, uh, advising, admissions, um, even our student success coaches and registration will all have people in one area and all the students will funnel there. If we need to have a more serious conversation, we pull them out. So everybody can go into one spot and get that. And so if you're wondering where that adage comes from, <laughs> we are literally spending several million dollars to redesign a building to do that. Wow. Um, you know, in our, in our last minute, I, I just want to quickly circle back to something you led with around, you know, 60%, I think, in, of institutions you said, according to the survey, don't have formal training around CPL. And I, I wanted to just invite you to share one of your solutions to that. You know, that, that you're proposing internally at MOT around credentialing, you know, a faculty and per perhaps others in assessing it, because I think it hints on not just consistent practices, but also on a way of building a bench for sustainable practices as we think of, you know, not, how do we not just do this cons consistently, but sustainably, given, you know, the limited resources we have. And, and Noah, you nailed it. And, and the last thing that I would add to that statement is it's verifiable and repeatable. So the, the thought process behind it is, is to credential or badge these faculty as part of their professional development. Um, it's a win for them. It's things that they have to do anyways. But as an institution, we can also go back to our accreditors and say, listen, we put our you know assessors through kale training, let's say, because um, they do have training for uh, for that purpose. 
we put them through that and then they get to assess documents or then they get to help students. So it, it's, it's just something that's, it's already there. It's super easy. It's part of the process and it would absolutely just, it, it's one step towards at least the institution standardizing. Um, John, I, that was just so succinct and amazing. We just learned so much in such a short amount of time. Um, hopefully everybody who is watching this live or gets to see it replay uh, is now able to appreciate just the, the acro all-star that, that you are, uh, for those of us who were in the room and got to see it live last week. Uh, thank you so much, John Caldwood from Mock Community College for joining us on this week's Credentials Chat. And Noah, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Have a badge-worthy week, everybody.